Chapter 20, Palma. Excerpt from the Citizens' Assembly on the Raising of Taxes on the Gridlock. Report number 216. Testimony from Randomly Selected Citizen, Mr. Mano White. We know how important it is to create this home and to create homes for others. This is evident in our published low Gini coefficient in the trunks. It is more equal due to our communal group saving schemes. It allows many more to own a car in the trunks. We enforce these ad hoc measures through decades of proof of Ostromian Commons management economics. We remind ourselves that no individual is above another and that in order to thrive, there's no need to sacrifice anyone. Many in the trunks do not support raising the taxes. High up in the grand banquet hall with the Emmers celebrating Sotelo's candidacy, Palma found himself in the kitchen's pantry, listening through the door. His white pants were stained red and the smell of salt pierced his nose. Two of his relatives were in the kitchen arguing. Palma listened. I don't think you understand the issue here. We risk everything if this leaks. It was all he could hear amidst the noise of the kitchen. What leaks? Something was wrong and Palma had to figure out what it was. A few minutes earlier, Palma wistfully stared over the banquet hall's balconies to the city below. Behind him were the sounds of revelry, large swaths of the extended Emmer family forcing laughter over canapes. In the night, lives in the city below flickered through windows in the distance. A stone's throw away above him, the blurred white clusters of stars hovered like cotton candy through public service announcements on the dome's transparent screens. For many, the penthouses were the dream. But for Palma, it was now a prison. He could not help, grounded and phoneless like a teenager. His freedom would be given back to him at the first trial. Palma! His younger cousin, Rally, shouted after him. We're starting! Palma went back inside and took a seat next to his parents. Many cousins, second cousins, and in-laws were all dressed in white, sitting alongside one large table in a beautifully decorated hall. Palma reluctantly raised his glass of red wine along with the rest of them. His uncle, Pren Immer, the patriarch of the family, spoke from a small raised podium. We are gathered today to celebrate my son and our golden son, Satello. We have no doubt in our hearts that he will deliver us the hope and answers we've been yearning for. When Stam Emmer saw the future and helped create this gridlock, little did he know that his great-grandson would be the one to continue this tradition of hope. To Sotelo! Cheers echoed through the White Hall. They drank. It looked like Prin was already drunk. There's also someone else in the family we wish to celebrate. We are one through our blood but family isn't just what happens underneath our skins. It's also about caring for those who share the goals of this family. One such wonderful woman, as many of you have grown closer to over the years, is Clara Emmer. Resident economics expert at the Mech Institute, she has put in the hard work to formalize our policies and to take advantage of this fortuitous legislative opportunity that's upon us. If the taxes are raised, we not only stand to increase our funding towards Initiative of Hope, like Stam Emmer first did, but also move to cure the city of the blight of the trunks and the mid-levels. The increased turnover will ruin that cancerous growth. We will thus retain control over what matters to this city, its gridlock, and its future. To Clara! Clara smiled at Tinu's brother on stage. Sitting next to her, Tinu coughed on the wine and lowered his raised glass, seemingly confused. Palma caught his father's glances, and it confirmed Palma's suspicions. His mother had been working on the report without telling either of them. His father stared into the white tablecloth, not meeting the eyes of his family around him. Clara, Tinu whispered, leaning in. She whispered back while keeping up appearances. I told you I would take this into my own hands, and look... It's working, isn't it? No one is mad. As always, you blow things out of proportion to avoid conflict. Palma surreptitiously leaned closer. His father pursed his lips and scrunched up the white tablecloth with his one hand. He tapped his frustration into the table. He took a deep breath and gestured to a waiter to bring some red wine. The waiter came over and filled the last of a bottle of red into Tinu's glass. An empty wine bottle meant the waiter wouldn't be able to help. So Palma got up, took another bottle from a nearby table, and started pouring for the surrounding family. 
When he got to his younger cousin, he gestured for him to help. Hey, Raleigh, don't just sit and do nothing. Help pour some wine for people. The boy hung back in his seat and replied with a voice entering and breaking out of puberty. Palma, we have waiters. Sit down, you're literally doing their job. Palma stumbled back and bumped into a waiter. Oh, sorry, sir, I'm just helping with the wine. The waiter replied, Sir, you really don't have to. The waiter was right. It wasn't his job, so he gave the bottle away. Raleigh clipped, See? Now you're being helpful. Palma reacted by pulling Raleigh into a head noogie. Raleigh wrestled free and sent Palma backwards into the table, spilling all the blood red wine across the white tablecloth. When he looked down to his white pants, they were stained red. Silence fell on the dinner, with judging eyes from the Emmers staring in his direction. Head hung low, he rushed into the kitchens to fetch salt to soak out the wine. Salt? He asked towards the kitchen staff, briefly pointing to his pants before keeping his arms in the air like a crab. You would have made a great addition to our crab selection, but unfortunately the kitchens are already full tonight, the staff member joked. Palma rolled his eyes. Ha ha, please, I need some salt for the stain. You'll need more than salt to get rid of that. I know, but it's worth a try. It's in the back in the pantry, the staff member said laughing. When he rounded the corner towards the pantry, two family members were arguing close by. Is, uh, everything okay here? Palma asked. The first man frowned at Palma's claws in the air and the red wine all over his body. He spoke. It's fine, Palma, it's fine. Nothing to worry about. Why does it look like you're about to be arrested with your hands up? Oh, (laughs) sorry, yes, caught me red-handed with wine on my pants. I'll just be in the pantry quickly. Palma pulled open the door, closed it behind him, and pretended to walk off into the distance of the large pantry. He backed up and pressed his ear to the door. He could hear them whispering again as they went back towards the halls through the kitchen. I don't think you understand the issue here. We risk everything if this leaks. He pressed his ear closer, but the kitchen noise drowned it out. Palma retrieved the salt and massaged it into his pants. What was that? What leaks? Upon returning to the table through stairs, he asked his parents, Dad, is there anything up with Uncle's dark and grin? They were arguing intensely back in the kitchen. What do you mean, Palma? Arguing? About what? Tinu said, gulping away more wine. Yes, arguing. Seems like something went wrong and that everything is at risk or something? Clara ended the conversation with an Emmer cousin as she turned around towards them, bowing her head as to not attract attention. What's going on? Palma said Dirk and Grin were arguing about something, Tinu said. Clara's hands nervously shifted from her fork toward Tinu's thigh. Is something wrong? Palma asked after seeing his mother pausing mid-chew. She looked at her phone, swallowed, neatly wiped her mouth, got up, and walked away. Palma looked back at his father. It's fine, it should be okay, Tinu said. Things are clearly not fine. Where's mom going? Palma asked. It's nothing. Here, have another glass of wine. Waiter? While the waiter poured, he could see Raleigh laughing at the corner of the table. As he took a sip, Sotelo sat down in Clara's seat with a massive slap on Palma's back. You almost spilled my wine, Palma said, coughing back a gasp. Sorry about that. Didn't think you'd have another glass after your fiasco, Sotelo said, his hand still gripping Palma's shoulder. Listen, I know you can't text yet, so I'm doing you a service quick. Just wanted to let you know, Flora will be fine without you. What do you mean? She started training with Argent now, another championship runner. Wait, why? Yes, I saw them becoming cozy at the briefing session, and then others saw them running around the city the other day. Word on the street is, Flora's got a super modern custom training mech. You don't happen to know where she got it? As you know, I'm not involved anymore, okay? I think you are lying. It came from the trunks, didn't it? You helped get it, didn't you? That's why you're grounded? Doing snooping, trying to find a mech for Flora... Sotelo leaned back towards Tinu sitting behind him. He raised his voice. And how do I know your parents aren't also helping? What are you trying to do? My parents didn't help, okay? Ah, so you did help. No, I was not involved in sourcing the mech. Honest truth. What's your problem? Now leave me alone before I accidentally also spill the wine on you. Palma lied just to get his cousin off his back. 
Sotelo didn't budge. My problem is that family isn't helping family, Sotelo said, inching closer. If I don't win, this is on you. Screw Flora. Sotelo walked around the table and gave Raleigh a shoulder punch for no apparent reason. Clara came back and started whispering to Tinu. Palma couldn't hear. What the hell is going on? Can you please tell me? Palma asked. They all looked at each other. Clara seemed particularly anxious. Tinu extended his hand to Palma's shoulder, but Clara urgently whispered, Be very honest with us. That evening we caught you. Is there more to the email snooping you did that you weren't telling us? Was there something else you were busy with? Palma looked at them both. He recognized their wrinkles in the dinner light. They weren't their younger selves anymore. No, nothing else. As I said before, I only looked at the emails. All I wanted to do was somehow find a mech for Flora, nothing more, Palma said, not meeting their eyes. He suddenly felt the saturated red wine against his skin, with the coarse salt drifting to his nose. He looked at them, trying to hide his lie. Can you tell me what's going on, please? Clara looked at her son. Dirk believes that someone hacked the computers at the Mech Institute. They found suspicious activity. And? Palma said as he held his breath. They found some anomalies but couldn't trace anything. Palma released his breath. That's a relief. Gotcha. Well, like I said, it wasn't me. Good, son. We're glad. Tinu said, breathing a sigh of relief and releasing his hand from Palma's shoulder. Seeing that sincere relief in his father's face hurt. Palma just wanted to help, and now he had to lie to keep it all from unraveling. Luckily, Esper, Rulo, and Saga seemed safe for now. He hoped it wasn't their activity that his family discovered. He instinctively reached for his phone to inform them, only to grab the wet, coarse salt. Feeling dizzy and untethered, with no way of helping until the end of the first trial, Palma held the waiter. Wine kept pouring, blood red, thicker than the water that never fell to the streets anymore. 